we've seen over 20,000 emergency calls. And I would say that 70% of them involved drug or, drugs or alcohol. 70%. Two of the campers volunteer to become demonstration accident victims. Now you guys immediately start to get very cold because you hurt very bad. And you're shivering, even in 114 degree weather. I've seen people just shake. You just uh, are wearing the steering wheel there in your chest. And it really hurts. And your legs are all messed up. And I'd like you to look at the lumen of this tube. It's great bit. It's like having a garden hose shoved up your arm. Oh. Oh. The needle comes out. This little skinny catheter goes up inside your vein so that we can pour some fluid in there. Here she's got her head clipped right up in the air, and I'm going to be sticking needles in her arm. She's very cold and in pain. This is not fun. There are some very unpleasant but necessary things that have to happen before you can go to surgery. Now, if you um, if you have been drinking, the, the molecules in alcohol are very heavy. They make you pee like a racehorse. <laughs> Just try having a few beers and see what happens. Makes your bladder very full. Now, if these little drunks were responsible little <laughs> drunks, and they put their seatbelts on, that impact of that head-on collision may very well cause them to rupture their bladder. And in order for the hospital to know if that's happened, a tube has to be run up your penis or up in your urethra. I'm not telling you these things to gross you out. I want to tell you that even if, if this isn't a punishment, it's medical diagnosis and a medical treatment. We want you to be very, very, very selfish when you're getting into cars with people who have been drinking because it doesn't matter if you're the drunk driver or the passenger that's hurt. These are medical things that have to be done to, to help you. Let's give our volunteers a big hand. Friday morning, the last day of lectures begins with an introduction to the juvenile court system. 18,000 children are processed through Clark County juvenile courts each year. The majority of referrals come from police agencies. Nevada law says you can be charged and we can house you in our detention center at eight years of age, okay? The other day, we had a nine-year-old in there. As a matter of fact, he went to Bill's cottage. You know what his crime was? He stole a doll. He stole a doll. I got another kid in there. As a matter of fact, this boy's in, in Bill's cottage. He's 13. Guess what he did? He shot his sister in the head. Think about it in terms of control. Who's in control now of your life? Who's got freedom? Who's got limited freedom? Who has decision-making over what happens to you in the next however long? You don't want me to become involved in your life, nor do, you, nor, do you want, nor do you want probation officers. You want choices. You want to be as independent as you can. You want to have the ability to have some freedom of movement. But once you get yourself involved with juvenile court services, you begin to limit the amount of freedom. You begin to limit the amount of access because now you have another player involved other than your parents. And many times this other player, this other player has more that they can do than what your parents can do. Okay? And I mean that very literally. The final lecture from the Nevada Department of Motor Vehicles restates the fact that car accidents are the leading cause of death for teens. And the national drunk driving death rate is high for all age groups. Right now, we're still killing 22,000 people a year to 23,000 people a year in drunk driving accidents. Every two years, we kill more people than we killed during the entire Vietnam War. Tough drunk driving laws were enacted in Nevada in 1983. 12,000 driver's licenses are suspended each year in Nevada. You can lose your license for 90 days and up to a full year. You get arrested and charged with drunk driving. Your car is towed away and you also get a ride in a police car. We think we have one of the toughest drunk driving laws in the country. Uh, we patterned our law after Minnesota. And uh, by and large, we're one, of the, we're one of the states that has, everything's mandatory. Uh, you go to jail, there's no plea bargaining, you lose your license, that's automatic. You have to go to DUI school and you have to pay for all that. All right. You know how much a DUI costs first time around, average? By the time you get through playing with everything, you can spend six grand. You not only lose your license, you know, you got to come back and you got to have three insurance for three years before we'll give it back to you. 
The sad camp ends with a dance on Friday night and cleanup and packing on Saturday. Friendships are cemented and each camper gets something out of the experience. This is my third year after the camp. I heard about the camp originally from a friend who conned me into going. I had no idea what I was getting into. And since then, I've met lots of people and I've learned lots of things I can take back to my school and friends that have helped me a lot throughout the years. I know so many people that do drugs and they're just, I can't handle it. I'm going to change their lives. I'm going to change my lives and everybody else. When you go back to school, is it tough? Is it tough to be a member of SAD and to be talking about drinking and driving and drugs and all that? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's, it's hard because, you know, you don't want to be the dweeb or you don't want to be the jerk in the, in the school or anything else like that. But it is also becoming cool. You know, it's cool not to drink and drive anymore. So we, we uh, are the group that's in now. Every year, there's some electricity there because of the bonding that goes on between the students. Because they have this mutual feeling of let's get out there and help our community um, progress. One of the students who attended the second camp as a recovering alcoholic explains the reality of teen alcoholism. Started off experimenting and um, being a teenager and trying to grow up and things, there's so many problems you have to deal with and so many things you have to face and it's so much easier just to deal with them drunk rather than so sober. When did you start drinking? In I mean, sixth grade. How does somebody in the sixth grade get a hold of alcohol? Well, my parents had it in the, in the liquor clo closet. How did you know that you needed help? When I, when I was very, very drunk, um, some friends of mine, they got in a fight and I was so drunk that I couldn't get off the floor to help to break up the fight and it really hurt me to stand there and watch them fighting and knowing that I couldn't get up. I didn't have the strength to get off the floor to save them. And I talked to a friend of mine that night later on as I sobered up a little bit and I said, I'm really scared. I hate being out of control like this. I hate not being in control of my life and I want some help. <laughs> This reel-to-reel -reel documentary repeats this Saturday night at 7.30. Striving to preserve the multiple 